Jason uh, has worked uh, very, very, very hard for a lot of us anglers to better understand our electronics and how to use them and ultimately how to catch more fish. And, you know, some of the technology available out there is very, very overwhelming. And Jason is probably as good a person as anyone to talk to anybody to understand where they're at in the learning curve and has really made a commitment in doing so. So, thank you, Jason. Here you go. Thank you, Dean. Everybody hear me okay? It's gonna take a second to get this thing pinned into my tire here. <clears throat> I appreciate you all coming today in a lousy, uh, in a lousy weather situation. What I'm going to uh, spend my time talking about today is specifically uh, a couple of different things. First of all, I'm going to give you some training on, on how to use and interpret side imaging from Hummingbird. I'm going to show you some specific examples of how I use a new technology, which is called 360 imaging, for doing the kinds of things that we all like to do when we're on the water. We're going to look at some multi-species applications of both hummingbird side imaging and 360 imaging. And I'm going to close the talk by focusing specifically on fish. Now when people start to think about the advanced imaging sonar technologies that are available today, whether it's a hummingbird side imaging or structure scan from Lorantz or things like that, quite often they think that those technologies are specifically associated with structure and that finding fish is sometimes a little bit of a bonus or maybe hard to do. What I'd like you to leave the seminar today with is the notion that that's completely incorrect. Finding fish with side imaging or 360 imaging is easy, and I'm gonna show you exactly how easy it is by walking you through a sequence that basically takes an entire year as we follow fish from as small as an inch and a half up to large game fish, walleyes, bass, and things like that, all on a, on a body of water that many of us are familiar with, all on pool four of the Mississippi River. So we're gonna track a whole bunch of different species of fish throughout the year, focusing specifically on those fish using hummingbird side imaging and 360 imaging. So what I'd like to start with is, uh, is basically a little lesson in how do we interpret the information that side imaging provides. So I'll start with the question, how many of you have a side imaging system or a structure sand system on your boat? That's good, almost half. Certainly this is a, an emerging technology that more and more people are taking advantage of. And for many people who, uh, who have a unit like that on their boat, they often, um, they often lack the fundamental understanding of how to interpret what they're seeing. This is certainly the case for people who are new to side imaging or structure scan or something like that. So I'm gonna teach you a little bit about how the systems work and how to interpret what we see. Now, uh, side imaging information is presented in kind of a historical or waterfall type display where the, in the uh, side imaging information that has been collected most recently is at the top of the screen and as we uh, drive along with our boat, that information waterfalls or cascades towards the bottom. So the newest information is always displayed at the top. This is what's going on right behind your transom. The oldest information is displayed down towards the bottom. In the middle of the side imaging display is this dark, is this dark stripe. That represents the water column immediately beneath your boat. So if you're used to thinking about the traditional sonar that has a little cone that shines right down from your transducer into the water column, that's the same portion of water that we're interrogating in this dark blue stripe. So this is what's right beneath the boat. Now, side imaging has an adjustable range side to side. In this case, my side imaging range is 100 feet on both sides of the boat. Okay, so I'm covering a 200 foot swath of water where I can investigate the, the water column itself, I can investigate what's in the water column above the bottom, as well as whatever happens to be on the bottom for a 200 feet wide path as I drive along, as I drive along. Now that range is entirely adjustable. Basically, you're gonna get the clearest images when that range is around 100 feet, say 80 to 120 feet on both sides. It's adjustable out to 240 feet, so think about that. You can be looking at 480 feet path of water, swath of water as you drive down the lake. It's an incredibly powerful way to gather a lot of information in a relatively short amount of time about structure and fish. Now, we'll go through the specifics of interpreting this particular side image in a little while, but I'll tell you that this is a weed bed. It's a weed bed up on the north end of Mille Lacs, and I can identify weeds pretty easily 
uh, particularly coon tail weeds like this, look like little cotton balls or balls of cauliflower. And that's one of the really good ways to identify weeds. We'll look at some other weed images in just a little while. So side imaging gives us a historical perspective about what's behind the boat. What have I driven past? That perspective is a little different if we look at 360 imaging. Now the kinds of views that we get with 360 imaging are similar to what we get with side imaging, except we collect them in an entirely different way. In 360 imaging, the transducer isn't connected to the back of the boat. Instead, it's on this little pod, this little arm, that can move up or down inside of a mechanical housing. Okay, if you're driving along in your boat, the housing is retracted all the way, the transducer's out of the water. But if you slow down and start to fish, you can lower the transducer into the water, lower the transducer pod into the water. It gets lower than your lower units. There's absolutely no obstructions from your boat or anything like that. And the transducer itself rotates within this little pod, within this little housing, and I'm sure we can take a look at it in some of the boats that are rigged up here today. Now, that rotating transducer provides us with the same sort of um, high precision uh, imagery that a side imaging transducer provides for us if it's on the back of our boat we're moving along. The way that information is displayed is in a constantly refreshing uh, pattern that is denoted by this white line. This white line sweeps around the side imaging display in clockwise fashion. The newest information is always displayed right behind the white line, and the oldest information that is being refreshed away is displayed in front of the white line. Okay, so as this white line rotates around, that indicates how the transducer is rotating around its housing. We are getting two refreshes of information for every time that that white line revolves around, revolves around the, uh, the, center, the center image. Now in this particular 360 image, we see some weeds. Okay, these are similar to the weeds that we, uh, that we looked at on the previous slide, these little cotton balls uh, that are indicative of low-growing weeds. And the interesting thing about uh, this particular image is down here at the bottom. I apologize that it's not big enough for many of you to see. Does anybody know what that might be down there at the bottom of the side of the, for the 360 image? Beds. These are bluegill beds. So this is an offshore colony of nesting bluegills that we found up on the Chippewa Flowage. Now, one of the great things about imagery that is displayed in this 360 image is that the position of the, of the information is always relative to the boat. So in other words, my boat is always going to be displayed, this little boat icon is always displayed facing up. I can look around the boat and figure out exactly where the interesting thing is that I should cast to. So in this particular case, if I want to go and try to drop bobbers on the bluegill bed, I should be fishing right out the stern. There's nothing up the bow or off to the sides, no weeds, but the gills are all out here behind the bat. We use 360 imaging in my boat extensively whenever we are position fishing. Whenever we're going to anchor up or use our spot lock function to fish bobbers or fish drop shot rigs or slow drifting or things like that because it provides us information about what's going on behind the boat in real time. Okay, and that's one of the things that distinguishes 360 imaging from side imaging. Side imaging is a historical view. 360 imaging is real-time information about what's going on all around the boat that you can use while you're out fishing. So that's a little bit about how side imaging and 360 imaging information is displayed. But it would be useful to give you some, a little bit of background about how we can interpret that information to distinguish different types of structure. One of the first things we note is that things that are really hard appear bright in whatever color palette might be happening to you. The intensity of the color reflects the amount of sonar energy that is transmitted back to the transducer. So if a very hard object, like in this case, those two concrete bridge pilings, are reflecting a lot of sonar energy back to the transducer, those bridge pilings will appear really bright. Okay, so we have some bridge pilings up there at the top. Uh, we have some fish cribs down here at the bottom. This is a group of cribs from Lake Wissota. This is an individual crib from over on Lake Menomen. One of the things that the cribs teach us is that large objects, things that are really tall off the bottom, cast significant sonar shadows. And you can think about this being like the shadow that a tree might cast. If a tree is really tall, if the sunlight is shining on the tree, that tree will cast a large shadow opposite the sun, right? because not a lot of that light energy from the sun is able to hit the ground. That's what gives rise to the, to the shadow that the tree casts. 
In the case of an object like these fish cribs down here, we see large sonar shadows, like these ones for the Lake Wissota cribs over here, because those objects are so big and so tall off the bottom that they do a really good job of blocking all the sonar energy from reaching the bottom on the opposite side of the crib relative to where the boat is. Okay, so tall objects cast shadows just like a tree might cast on a sunny day. Now, here's our first example of some fish, and we'll come back and look at lots of other fish in a little while. Imagine how easy it would be if you were cruising along a line of cribs, and certainly on Lake Wissota, Lake Manoma, and a lot of our other area lakes have large concentrations and clusters of fish cribs. Imagine how easy it would be to drive past them and identify which cribs have fish on them, so you're not fishing the naked crib, but instead you're fishing a crib that's full of 12 and 13 to 14 inch crappies. Side imaging can do that for you. Here's just one example of a fish crib that has a, that has a little peppering of white dots associated with it. These are the fish that are associated with this particular crib. And if we collect the information in the correct way, we can easily distinguish cribs that have fish on them from cribs that don't. And it makes us more efficient when we're on the water. Okay, so side imaging not only provides us information about where the structure is, it also enables us to fish that structure more efficiently by telling us which parts of it have fish and which parts don't. So all those things are all man-made. Let's look at some other things that aren't so man-made. Uh, side imaging is very efficient at identifying hard bottom, soft bottom transitions. In all the side imaging color palettes, hard bottom, like gravel or hard packed sand or rock bottom, things like that, all appear very bright. That's because those very hard objects reflect significant sonar energy back to the transducer. Those, those bottoms are nice and bright. Soft bottom, like muck or mud or silt or marl or things like that, appears much darker. And so what we see here in this side image is a very distinct hard bottom, soft bottom transition. When is that important? Well, it's, it's, right now it's important if you're a perch fisherman. You're trying to find where the soft bottom butts up against hard bottom areas. Those are key transition areas for targeting perch during the ice fishing season. During the early part of the uh, open water season, we're always looking for soft bottom bays, bays that have dark bottoms dark bottoms and side imaging to help accumulate heat and help hold those early season panfish. Over here on the right, we have some more, uh, we have some hard packed sand, some soft bottom, and some rock pads. Okay, these distinct uh, round objects that are much brighter than the surrounding bottom. Those are rock pads. Those are rocks off the north end of on the west. Uh, these bottom two uh, pictures show us what different kinds of fish look like. And we'll come back and talk more about fish in a, in, a, in a few subsequent slides. On the left side, we have fish that are riding way off the bottom. Okay, these are mostly paddlefish and, um, and catfish and sturgeon. These are fish that uh, I imaged in the scour hole beneath, the, beneath dam number three down there in pool number four. Okay, so these are fish that are way off the bottom. They're relatively large. I know they're way off the bottom because the sonar shadows that they cast are a long way from the individual images of the fish. We'll talk more about that in just a little while. So fish that are riding high off the bottom have a large distance between their shadow and the, and the sonar return from the fish. On the right-hand side over here, we have fish that are lined up in depressions in a washboard bottom of the river. So you can see the washboard bottom as these little horizontal stripes that are moving from left to right. Those are the low spots, of course, Whenever current interacts with, uh, with the sand bottom, it will develop this washboard bottom. During high current times, fish will tuck in to those low spots in the washboard bottom. And we see those fish tucked in in all of the low spots. Right? We don't see them, for the most part, outside of those low spots. Of course, those low spots are places where they can get out of the current and not spend all their energy just trying to survive. So that's a look at fish that are high and fish that are low. We'll come back and talk more about fish in a little while. Let's look at some rocks. Here we have a, uh, a man-made row of rocks. This is a closing dam uh, that's about four feet deep on top with sand bottom on either side. Which side of that, say, of that closing dam is the upstream side? The, right, the top one, right? The water flows from top to bottom here. We know that the water is flowing from top to bottom because as that water flows over the closing dam, it generates a lot of turbulence and that turbulence scours out little streaks in the bottom, little low spots at the bottom where some of that sand has been washed away by the turbulent water flowing over the closing dam. On the right hand side over here, we have a very distinct transition between rocks, again, 
bright white things that are hard, they're reflecting a lot of energy back to the transducer, and now we see that nice rounded shape like you might expect for some, for some rock structure. We have a bunch of rocks over here transitioning very sharply to clean sand bottom. Okay, that's a look at uh, some of the water off Pikes Point up in the northwest corner of the last. One of the things that was really an eye-opener for me when I started fishing uh, with side imaging fishing systems is how distinct that transition is. Right? I had fished that area many times over the years, didn't really appreciate how abruptly the bottom went from lots of rocks to totally clean sand bottom. Well, side imaging showed me that in one quick trip. That one pass over that area with side imaging showed me that there's an extensive rock flat and then he just stopped and the bottom transitions to clean sand. So let's look at some rocks and spend a little bit more time looking at our other favorite structure type, which is weeds. And I have a couple of images here of some sparse weeds from early in the season that look like little cotton balls or little, little packs of the cauliflower, I like to think about them. These are low-growing weeds that are three or four feet tall. Uh, and on the right hand, or left hand side over here, I have uh, some very thick weeds. Now this is from a bay up on Lake Wissota that gets weed choke, and this is during the weed choke time of the year. We know that these, bay, that, these, uh, that these weeds are thick, and we have weeds over here on the right, weeds on the left, and several little piles of them here in the middle of the bay. We know that these weeds are thick because they cast very distinct sonar shadows. Right? So if the boat is driving along here in the middle, it's uh, transmitting uh, uh, sonar energy off to the left and the right. Almost all that energy is being reflected back to the transducer, and none of it is imaging behind those weeds. Those weeds are so thick that they're just they're, they're, they're preventing solar energy from reaching the shoreline on the other sides of those weeds. So we've got some thick weeds on the left, we have some thin, sparse weeds over on the right. But that's the general appearance that weeds will have. 